So, we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 7. Last time, we finished with verse 39. And today, I'm going to back up to verse 38 for the context and read from the New King James Version in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, beginning at verse 38. He who believes in me, well, this is Jesus talking, I guess I should say that. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Therefore many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, Truly this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. Now some wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd does not, that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And everyone went to his own house. Now, we're kind of in the middle of the story. We, we rejoin the narrative today on the heels of one of the greatest gospel invitations of all time. Jesus had just invited a huge crowd at the Feast of the Tabernacles to come to him and to truly believe in him and that he would give, him, give them eternal life. And he is also promising to fill the believers to overflowing with the Holy Spirit of God. Verse 38, He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So last week we looked at the Scriptures that he talked about. We explored several common questions and concerns about the Holy Spirit and his work in a believer's life. And, you know, if you missed that, I'd encourage you to, to watch online the teaching and study it and understand better how this promise can become real in the life of every believer. We also read in Galatians 16, 22 to 23, the beginning of 23, that says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithful, gentleness, self-control. Now, I hope and pray that you see this fruit as believers every day in your life and in the lives of other believers that you fellowship with on a regular basis. Now, as you examine your life and consider those that you associate with, even for a few minutes, sometimes out here in the, in the campground, the question may arise, why, does, why do some believers not exhibit the fruit of the Spirit? Now, we talked about quenching the Spirit last time, so review and examine your life to make sure that you're not quenching the Holy Spirit of God. And, and further, don't be shy. Go ahead and encourage other believers to be bold and to be full of the Spirit of God, be full of faith to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in their lives as well. You know, there are gifts that your brothers and sisters have that God will never give you. Understand that you can have a tremendous impact on the kingdom of God when you help others use their giftings, find their giftings as well. And then you'll also see more fruit in your lives and their lives. So it's a win-win situation. And sometimes the lack of fruit comes down to a simple word, and that is unbelief. What? A believer with unbelief? Yes, that happens. I'm not talking about a complete abandoning of the faith, but sometimes we don't really believe, like the Bible talks about. We're not clinging to, relying on, trusting in, and fully committed to our Lord Jesus Christ and His ways. We desire our own ways instead. And that's only natural. The Bible calls it walking in the flesh. We're all made out of flesh. You know, the Bible puts it in Galatians 16. Just before it lists those fruits of the Spirit, it says in verse 16, I will say then, 
Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. By the way, I find it interesting that they, that they put murder along with selfishness. You know? Anyway, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then verse 25 sums it up. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And we can't do this alone. Sometimes, I mean, someone has said that it's not hard to live a Christian life. It's impossible without the Holy Spirit. And how true is that? So, brothers and sisters, let us walk in the Spirit. Our life lesson here is walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and help other believers do the same. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and help others do the same. Other believers do the same. So let's continue in today's text. Verse 40. Therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard this, said, Truly, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. You know, there's always some response to an invitation to come to Jesus. You know, some people say one thing, others another. Everyone has an opinion. Sometimes they don't voice them, but you can't hear Jesus and then remain neutral. If someone acts like or says that they're neutral, that's choosing to be against him. So that is a choice. In this crowd, some knew that by the prophet, saying the prophet, the Messiah was meant. Others seemed to have thought that maybe there was an ancient prophet was rise from the dead and come back again before the appearing of the Messiah. We'll explore why this was happening in a moment, but let's read on in verse 41. Some, but some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seat of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. Well, so here there's division and people were arguing. They were confused about the facts and how they lined up with different scriptures. And since that never happens in any church today, I'll quickly move on to the next verse. Oh, no, of course. This is so, so relevant for us today and for the church. And even more so for those who need to find the light of Jesus. Unfortunately, there is darkness. There's confusion all around us. And I hate to say it, but many don't really concentrate on dispelling that. They don't try to dispel that, but actually feed on it. While lost souls shake their heads at them. And then they travel on towards a Christless eternity. Brothers and sisters, that is not good. That need not be. So this, there's three things that we need to address to kind of help us understand this. The first thing is, determine if there is a real conflict. Now, in this case, would the Messiah come from Galilee or would he be from David's family and come from Bethlehem? Which is it? <laughs> well, we know now the scriptures point to both. We've previously studied how Nathaniel, we talked about him, how he realized that Jesus was the Messiah as he understood the prophecies about Jesus' hometown being in Nazareth of Galilee. We also know that when he was born, the religious leaders had told King Herod that the king of the Jews was to be born in Bethlehem. And so we know he comes from there. And there's a third option that's not mentioned by these folks, and that is um, in Hosea 11.1, Hosea 11 it provides a picture that God calls his son out of Egypt. Now, it's referring in the immediate context to Israel's deliverance at the Passover, but it's also a picture pointing to how Jesus was being saved by, from King's, King Herod's massacre of the infants by fleeing to Egypt, and subsequently, God called his family back when Herod died. So 
The second thing is, number two is to look for truth instead of conflict. Look for truth instead of conflict. We've actually seen the scriptures saying that the Messiah could have been from, you know, could come from Bethlehem or Egypt or Galilee. When you look for the truth, we find the, the Messiah actually came from all three of them. He was born in Bethlehem. He was called out of Egypt. He was raised up in ministry in Galilee. So guess what? The truth dispels all the perceived conflicts that people get caught up into. So a life lesson for us, it does apply to us today, yes. Life lesson is don't find conflict where it doesn't exist. Search out the truth and your questions will be answered. Don't find conflict where it doesn't exist. Search out the truth and your questions will be answered. You know, so much conflict is magnified and, and the world sees different groups of Christians arguing about things that they've never truly fully studied. God's truths are much higher than our understanding and we must seek the ultimate truth and accept that seemingly conflicting truths in our mind, conflicting thoughts are not really that way. And oh yes, two different teachers may issue, see an issue seemingly different ways and then they study day and night to support the thing they thought of. And they quote scripture after scripture, defending their viewpoint, arguing with others. But God is not an author of confusion and if they would both seek out the entire truth on the matter and even share with each other, they would overcome that matter that seems to divide them and they will both be at peace. And they'll be more effective in ministry and be a light to the world as God wants us to be. Uh, in Proverbs, I found three scriptures and I've, in the Amplified, I'm gonna read them. It, uh, Proverbs 18 gives us three observation with tons of wisdom. Verse 13, he who answers a matter before he hears the facts, it is folly and shame to him. Verse 17, same chapter. He who states his case first seems right until his rival comes and cross-examines him. And then verse 19, a brother offended is harder to be won over than a strong city and their contentions separate them like the bars of a castle. Now we all need to be slower to push our point of view on a matter until it's studied out and allow it to be cross-examined in the light of more scripture as the Holy Spirit guides and teaches us. Otherwise, we'll make our enemies, we'll make enemies of our brothers. That's not to be, okay? We allow God's work to speak for God's word to speak for itself. And of course, we study the scriptures to fully understand them. We bring the context and thoughts from God to light but we must be careful when we start trying to prove a point that's not very clearly supported throughout the entire scriptures. And finally, the third thing we need to take note of here, the third thing is God is not honored when leaders fail to lead. And it brings us right back into our scriptures today. An unfortunate fact of life is that leaders can and actually do fail to lead people. In our text, we see a terrible price that's paid when the leaders aren't leading the people to believe in God, to believe in God's Son, to believe in the scriptures being studied, the scriptures that Jesus was sharing with them. Instead of leading their followers, they try to control their followers. They intentionally blind themselves and others to the truth. Uh, just in this one chapter alone, I look back, we've seen the results of the leaders, religious leaders failing to lead. They wanted to be the sole source of knowledge so they didn't even want people to talk about Jesus, that he might be the Messiah. Then they expressed surprise that Jesus might actually know something that they hadn't taught him, as if they were the source of all knowledge. Then they spread rumors that he was demon possessed, all in the same chapter here. We also see that knowing he had come from the place where the prophets had predicted that he would be born, they apparently thought that nobody would know the difference and they started teaching people that nobody would know where the Messiah would be born or come from. And then when the people saw through that, the people knew better, they sent other people, they sent the officers to try to do away with Jesus, get rid of them. When those officers, in our text today, those officers realized the truth of what Jesus said, 
<laughs> then the leaders once again twisted Jesus' words to make it seem like something different than what the people had clearly understood Jesus to say. So now they've caused division and are wanting to get rid of him so that people wouldn't follow him anymore. Verse 44, now some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. The arrest was unsuccessful, but it wasn't because the arresting officers were incompetent. It was because the time was not yet right, and it was impossible. God made it impossible for Jesus to be stopped until it was right in the Father's timing. As we mentioned last week, Satan fills their hearts, but God ties their hands. Just as hate and opposition from Jesus' enemies is always unreasonable, we also find that the failure of their plans is also humanly unexplainable. And the text doesn't even try to explain how they couldn't take him. It just says nobody could lay a hand on him. And of course, that made the haters even more outraged. Uh, when their plans were foiled, they seemed to literally lose their minds. They began to lose their minds, I, I think. We'll see in the next few verses what they're saying doesn't even make sense. Verse 45, then the officers came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, why have you not brought him? <laughs> the officers, they had the arrest warrant. It was the last day of feast, so this was the time to take him away. There wouldn't be another opportunity, they thought, for a long time. And if they didn't do away with him now, Jesus would have his own army next time, and he would be taking them away. They were scared. But they were also powerless when they went to arrest him. It was an army of men, the officers, up against the strongest thing they had ever faced, the word of God. Verse 46, the officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. A lot in that verse, in those simple words. These chief priests and Pharisees had ex been expecting their orders to be carried out. They sent men to go and get Jesus. And these men, they would, no one would ever suspect they would disobey or, or be biased in favor of Jesus. Yet sure enough, these officers failed to carry out the very words of the leaders that they were pledged to serve. These leaders probably got a headache when they saw Jesus simply talking to people. <laughs> the, the, the officers speaking these words back to them were like scraping fingernails on a blackboard to their masters. They spoke the truth that no man ever spoke like this man. And everyone knew what they meant. That no man has spoken with this wisdom, with this power, with the grace, the unwavering clarity, and, and maybe even the charm that was shown under pressure. Nobody spoke like Jesus, not their teachers, not their leaders, not even the words of the prophets, and no, not even of Moses himself as portrayed by the religious leaders, only Jesus. They couldn't arrest him. They were probably thinking, this is the Messiah. This is, he might even be God. We're not gonna be known as the ones who put God in jail. <laughs> so, I mean, they, in their minds, they, they just could not arrest him. Verse 47, then the Pharisees answered them, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or Pharisees believed in him? Now, did I tell you these guys were mad? They were literally losing their minds, okay? Of course, these were rhetorical questions. They were saying that even their own officers were being deceived and that none of the rulers or Pharisees believed in Jesus. They didn't want an answer to that questions, those two questions because a little fact-checking from the scriptures is in order here. By the way, that's the only kind of fact-checking we can trust, okay? We can be sure about. We studied back in chapter four about a nobleman, a ruler in Galilee whose dying son was healed simply by Jesus speaking the word. It says, so the father knew that it was at this self, it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives and he himself believed and his whole household. Who believed along with his whole household? A ruler. Hmm. A few chapters ahead, John 12, 42, it says, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Have any of the rulers or Pharisees believed? <laughs> well, <laughs> Guys, as a matter of fact, yes, they did. Absolutely. The scripture says many. 
There were many, but they were scared of the crazy Pharisees. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> well, the, the believers back then didn't say it out loud. Okay? They believed in Jesus. Verse 49, the, the, the loud Pharisees were continuing, says, but this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. And in the Amplified, it says, a little bit clearer, it says, as for this multitude, this rabble that does not know the law, they're contemptible and doomed and accursed. So yes, indeed, the believers were a little afraid. Uh, there's a passage we'll discuss when we get to chapter 12. We'll go into more details there. But here, I'm, I'm, I was kind of curious as to the word accursed as they speak of that as the crowd. What did they mean? So my mind went to the, the picture of uh, Bull, Bullwinkle and Rocky show. You remember Dudley Do-Right? You know, he defeats the villain, Snidely Whiplash, and, and Snidely mutters, curses, foiled again. <laughs> okay, I'm showing my age. <laughs> but that's exactly how the Pharisees are using it here. Oh, they're cursed, you know? <laughs> they're saying, We're, we've been foiled again. They're insulting the people who are truly honoring the Lord, calling them contemptible and doomed and cursed. I told you they lost it. The only other place we see this word used is in the New Testament is in Galatians, where Paul wrote to the church that, that thought we need to follow the law. And he was trying to help them understand that complete and full salvation is from faith in Jesus Christ, not from the work that it was following the law. Galatians 3, 10 to 14 tells us, and quotes a lot from the Torah. I'm going to mention those references here. It tells us, verse 10, For as many as are the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Deuteronomy 27, 26. Then verse 1, But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2, 4. Verse 12 says, Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Leviticus 18, 5. I mean, if, if, you, if you expect to, to be justified by the law, you've got to follow it, every bit of it, or else it doesn't count. Verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Deuteronomy 23 uh, 21, 23. And it continues, verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The law did not provide the promise of the Spirit. It did not provide salvation. It did not provide justification. Uh, yes, if we believe in God, we want to follow what He wants us to do. But that is not what justifies us. That is not what brings us salvation. This is so rich. And all of these things that they're talking about are in the Hebrew Scriptures. And the Pharisees could have known this, but they were so far off in their minds. Um, <laughs> you know, this was all shown in Scriptures. They simply failed to study them or they failed to believe them. And in fact, we see, we see them resisting the grace and the mercy that comes through faith in Jesus to break that curse. Instead, they're saying that those who don't continue in the cursed way are the cursed. What a contrast. We've seen a ton of examples of how to behave, how to speak, how to act uh, while looking at Jesus. And the irony here is that those who are supposed to be teaching the ways of God are actually the ones whose bad example we're being warned against in the scripture here. So our life lesson here is positive. <laughs> it is look to Jesus as your example, not to men. Look to Jesus as your example, not to men. I'm not saying that there aren't men that are godly examples or that there are not things in the lives of others that are worth emulating. There are. I'm saying that even the best men will disappoint you at some level. So only follow them as they follow Jesus. When they're not, just throw it away. Don't follow that, you know? Now, despite the fear and the antagonistic atmosphere in the room with the Pharisees and the chief priests that day, we do find one man, one of their own, who tried to bring a bit of order and, uh, and common sense to that day. It was in verse 50, Nicodemus, 
who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? And they answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. Um, that, that was an insult, by the way, <laughs> if you don't know that. Nicodemus was the man that came, of course, and learned so much from Jesus back one night in chapter 3 that I, I think he truly became a believer in Jesus that night. And he may have been. He was probably the one that was sharing his faith quietly with the others and, you know, the ones that were receptive among the leaders. But we also see the vocal ones, the antagonistic ones, the ones that eventually set the negative trend among the Jews to reject their Messiah. These men these men quickly turned to attack their own. As we mentioned a couple of weeks back, these leaders had made calling Galilee, someone a Galilean into an insult. If they had only known the scriptures, they would have known. 2 Kings 14.25 spoke of Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who is from Gath Hefer. Interesting. Jonah was a prophet that Jesus referred to when he spoke of the sign that he would give them of his death, burial, and resurrection. He had reminded them of Jonah. Gath Hefer, or Hefer, I'm not sure exactly how to say it, it was just three miles north of Nazareth, where in Galilee. Jonah was definitely a Galilean. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Elijah was from Thisbe in Galilee. It's also likely that Nahum and Jose were also from Galilee. Not only were these religious leaders religiously wrong, but they were provably historically and factually wrong. And if they even had a little bit of Nathaniel's wisdom and had listened to Jesus, they would have known that the scriptures did indeed point to Nazareth as the place where the prophet, the Messiah, would appear from, would be raised up from. And at the same time, we remember that it was the chief priests and the scribes that told Herod that Christ would be born in Bethlehem. So they knew Jesus was born there. So they knew he had come originally from Bethlehem. And yet they were talking about Galilee. They were mixed up. Uh, if you missed it, take a, take a few minutes to a few hours <laughs> to listen to the first few teaching in the series and you'll see how very many people had been told in, and shown in supernatural ways that Jesus the Messiah had been born in Bethlehem. Literally all of Jerusalem knew that. That's what the Bible says. There is no way that these Pharisees and chief priests didn't know that. They were the original <laughs> fake news. <laughs> Prophecy, to, I mean, uh, Pharisees tonight, fake news. <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, actually, the, the, the original uh, fake news was in the Garden of Eden with the serpent. He was the original fake news. But we pretty much see how, how that ends up. So once again, the religious leaders here were lying. It's sad. It's sad. Pardon me? No. And, and our life lesson here is don't just take someone else's word for what the Bible says. Read it and study it for yourself. Don't just take someone else's word for what the Bible says. Read it and study it for yourself. Especially when you're listening to me. Okay? If it doesn't sound right, even if it does sound right, still go and look and study it out. It seems that many others, including the full group of Pharisees and the priests, were, were kind of getting tired of this lying, uh, the deceit, the plot against Jesus. And we see what happens after all this. Verse 53 and everyone went to his own house. <laughs> I, I, it just struck me as funny. So, sometimes it's just time to go home. The plot was foiled. Why? Because Jesus wasn't supposed to die. <laughs> no, no. Because Jesus had been telling him about his death for years now. It was because it was not yet time for Jesus to die and rise again. And God was in control. And today... God is still in control. Now, next time we'll see how even though the religious leaders all went home, Jesus didn't. He went to the Mount of Olives instead. He had work to do. There was ministry to be done. But I also think that this night was one of those nights when he stayed up very late or maybe even all night long praying. 
communicating, hearing from his father. The next morning, we'll see very early, he'll be teaching in the temple again. They thought he, it was over, the feast was over, he'll be gone, but there he is, he'll be teaching in the temple again. They'll get wind of it and they'll bring a woman to him. They'll drag a woman in that needs forgiveness and accuse her. It could have been you. It could have been me. We all need that forgiveness and we all need to see the love and compassion that Jesus has for us as we find ourselves in, in the middle of one of these messes that we get ourselves into from time to time. If you need forgiveness today, take a few minutes and ask God to forgive your sins. Believe in Jesus, that he is trustworthy, he is reliable, he wants to have a relationship with you and is willing to, and in fact, died on the cross so that you would just have the opportunity to ask him to forgive you of your sins. Don't take that for granted. We all need him in our lives today. Brothers and sisters, Jesus deserves our trust, deserves the faith we put in him as our king, as our Messiah. Let him be king of every area of your life today. And you know what area he's talking to you about today. As we close, I want to pray a blessing over you from God's word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen.